Bienvenidos de nuevo a Cibercamp 2015. Os vamos animando a que os acerquéis al auditorio. Es prontito, pero nosotros ya arrancamos este último día de este gran evento. We're going to start the third and last day of this marvelous uh, event. This, we're about to finish. So many activities, workshops still to be conducted. The very first paper. Mark Murray, he is a computing engineer and he got a master in sciences of information and telecommunications. During this last year of studies, he focused on cybersecurity. He's working on tools as to detecting and responding to incidents. And over the past years, he's been part of the uh, Advanced European Cybersecurity Center. It's really a pleasure to have you here. Uh, basically, I don't speak Spanish. I don't, I don't know to say anything. But hola, cómo estás? So <laughs> I will need to help this presentation in English. Uh, so yes, uh, how come that uh, I am into uh, into bitcoins? Well, basically, as as a member of Croatian National Cert. We had uh, a lot of situations that uh, uh, lot of situations of blackmailing. Uh, for example, uh, recently we had uh, one hackers group in Croatia that uh, that was doing a DDoS attack on on some uh, firms in Croatia, and uh, they were asking for ransom in bitcoins, and as well we. We often know that there are many ransomwares around the world, and uh, uh, ransoms are always in bitcoins. And of course, as my my job is to to catch criminals, uh, I started to wonder myself: uh, Would it be possible to de-anonymize the bitcoin addresses that uh, those criminals are giving to? To, to the to the firms that the the addresses they at which they want their payments to be uh, to be made and uh, yes basically I started to research uh, what what are my chances to de-anonymize to de-anonymize uh, some Bitcoin address uh, so I suppose. Uh, Everybody here who was interested in this presentation knows something about Bitcoin. But for uh, those of you who does not know anything, uh, I made just a brief introduction, uh, just for the sake to uh, to introduce main elements that one needs to understand to to be able to to understand uh, the anonymization methods. Uh, basically, there are two complementary anonymization methods. Uh, one is uh, transaction graph analysis, and another one is real-time network analysis. And I will say something about how each of it works, uh, what, what are the chances to de-anonymize anything, and uh, can I have some realistic expectations of, of those methods. Okay, so let's start with introduction. So what is, what is Bitcoin? Uh, Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer network uh, where users are transacting, uh, are, are transacting uh, digital money uh, between each other. And uh, the, the peers that are actually users are generating transactions and broadcasting them on network. And uh, they are broadcasting those transactions to, to each peer that is neighbor of, of the peer in question. And, there's, and then subsequent peers are transacting further. So in the matter of few seconds, the whole network is aware of, of some transaction that took place. Uh, okay, something wrong. So uh, on the other side, there, are, there is a subset of, of those peers uh, called miners that are collecting those transactions 
and putting them on the pile. And together, together with, with those transactions, they are adding some uh, random data uh, that in such way that, that uh, the hash of, of, of those collected transactions plus, plus data is generating, uh, is generating hash which meets some specific condition. Uh, those, that hash is not easy to find and uh, miners need, need to be fast and need to be lucky to be the first one who will, uh, who will generate who will generate the block. Uh, miner that first generates the block is broadcasting that block to the network in the same manner that our transactions are broadcasting. And uh, so basically, uh, basically block is containing transactions and all peers are, are uh, learning are learning blocks individually every peer for itself but at the end uh, at the end there is a consensus which I will not talk about it is outside of this of this talk there is consensus that uh, that puts state that every peer actually has a same uh, same uh, sequence of of blocks on their computers, and that sequence of blocks is called blockchain. Uh, the blockchain is basically a set of all transactions that ever took place in the Bitcoin network. Okay, uh, so now I start with the, with the first method of de-anonymization, and that is transaction graph analysis. So here I need to say something more about uh, transaction itself. So in the picture, you can see that uh, transactions are, are split on two parts. That is input part and output part. On the input part are all Bitcoin addresses that are sending, that are sending the Bitcoins. And the output part are all Bitcoin addresses that are receiving the, the Bitcoins. Uh, so why is transaction graph analysis possible? Because the blockchain is a public, so everybody can see him. But though he is the public identity of those uh, Bitcoin addresses is hidden. So Bitcoin address is basically just hash of the public key of the user, uh, of the user that is, that is owner of that, of that uh, key pair. And, uh, and uh, as picture suggests, uh, there is uh, there is three main three main concepts that uh, you need to be aware of to to be able to to speak about the anonymization. So the first first concept is that uh, input is always equals output. So if you have 10 bitcoins and you want to pay some, to somebody something uh, worth of seven bitcoins, you actually need to, pay, to spend all 10, but uh, three bitcoins that are left over, you need to, to pay to yourself back. So therefore, therefore, as if you look the second transaction, uh, you, have always, you have always one additional Bitcoin address uh, that is actually change address, and that is the address when you uh, when you paying the coins back to yourself. Uh, except except that uh, there is also a transaction fee, as you can see on picture, and transaction fee is the reward for the miner for his effort to to secure the network and. Uh, if what if transaction if transaction fee is what is the tra transaction fee bigger, uh, the miner is is taking your transaction as uh, as privileged transaction to to be included in block. Uh, what is complementary? If you don't pay the transaction fee, then 
you may wait quite a bit to to get confirmation that you really that you really paid something. Uh, how to de-anonymize using blockchain. So how is possible to de-anonymize de something if you have only Bitcoin addresses that looks like random, random data? So basically, two, there are two concepts that allows the de-anonymization. First concept is wallets. So uh, basically, every user is is owner or is very often owner of multiple Bitcoin addresses. And when he's doing big payment to somebody, some big payment, and he have no enough, uh, enough coins on one address, he need to use, on input side, he need to use many. He need to use many addresses in order to execute transaction. So basically, when we see in blockchain some transactions that have uh, multiple, that have multiple Bitcoin addresses on input side, that means that all of those addresses are owned by same user. So uh, that is not the anonymized user, but it is something to know that they are all owned by by same user, by same entity. So. In that way, the, the wallets are actually proof or share control. So if you see that some transaction is assembled from multiple Bitcoin addresses, they all belong to the same user. Uh, second thing that, that enables the, the anonymization using blockchain is the fact that many many people are publishing their Bitcoin addresses publicly on the web. So, for example, uh, on many forums you can find people, uh, people making signature using their, their address. And uh, on blockchain.info, which is main blockchain explorer, there is an option to tag itself. So you can if you are running some service or some website, you can, uh, you can, and uh, some service where you are, uh, somebody needs to pay you something, you can add your uh, Bitcoin address to, to the tax so people can, uh, can use this, this registry to find you. So basically, what we can do is uh, by crawling the web, by crawling the forums, by crawling the blockchain.info. Uh, they are not have some specific AP, so it is need to be done by crawling. Uh, we can collect all tagged addresses. Other way of collecting, of collecting tags is by, to say, active uh, pinging. So, for example, if there are some merchants places on, on the web, and you want to know which which Bitcoin addresses they are using for payout, you can on purpose buy things just to generate transactions to be to collect all those addresses. Okay, uh, so now when we uh, when we are aware of concept of wallet and on concept of tagged users we can use a uh, method of clustering to actually produce even more, even more tagged addresses. So uh, there are, three, there are three, main, uh, three main things about clustering, three main methods that, that are to be used. First of it is uh, linking different inputs to the same user. So if you have two transactions, one with inputs a and B, another one with inputs B and C, it is obvious that and E and B and C are belonging to same user. So in this way, if you have users with a lot of Bitcoin addresses, uh, on time by time you can achieve very quick expansion of that cluster. Uh, another thing is tagging clusters. So when you have uh, with, with when you were uh, doing the, the, the first step of linking different input, inputs to the same user, 
you achieved a very big cluster. And if you are able to find any of address from that cluster to be associated to any of tags, you can immediately, you can immediately tag all cluster to belong to the same user. And uh, finally, when you have clusters, different clusters that are tagged with same user, you can combine all these clusters to, to one single user. Uh, exa exactly such approach was done by the researchers of University of California in December of 2013. So it was just in the time of uh, Bitcoin boom when uh, price rise exponentially as well as hashing power. Uh, they parsed blockchain and basically even now there is on the GitHub few different available projects uh, that are that are uh, doing uh, that are doing softwares for for efficient parsing of blockchain. And uh, in the analysis of December of 2013, they managed to extract uh, 16 million transactions and 12 million millions public keys. That is 12 millions of Bitcoin addresses. And when they did clustering based on the method I said on previous slide they managed to produce 5.5 million of clusters. And when they combined clusters using, uh, using the third method, uh, they end up with 2,000 clusters less, which is not something, but, uh, uh, but there, there was, for example, a, do, a lot of clusters that were tagged to then main uh, crypto, cryptocurrency exchange, MTGOX. And uh, they excluded so-called sync addresses for this, for, from this clustering. Uh, sync addresses are, are addresses that, uh, that own some Bitcoins and those Bitcoins haven't been spent since 2011, so two years after uh, Bitcoin w was invented. Uh, so th those addresses are belonging to users that was a part of Bitcoin experiment. And uh, actually, they probably thought that it will, it will never worth anything, so they just lost their wallets. And at at that point, in December 2013, 64% uh, of all Bitcoins were actually in sync addresses, so unable to use. So in circulation was only like 36%, and now is in circulation about 60%. Okay, so there are some privacy recommendations. Uh, taking into account that everybody is aware that the anonymization is possible. So use new addresses to receive payments. This recommendation is there to enable somebody to see, uh, to see what, types of, what types of transacting you are doing. Uh, other one is to use multiple wallets for different purposes. So if, if somebody enforces this privacy recommendation, in that case, I'm unable to, I'm unable to expand the cluster quickly. And the third one, uh, which is the most important one, Bitcoin address should be only used once. Uh, that means that whenever you are paying something and you have leftover, that leftover you should you should pay to newly generated address and not to already existing one. Uh, why, is that, why is that important? So if you, if you have change and you return, you return change to, to your own address, then it is obvious from the picture, from the picture then it is obvious that A paid B. And if you, uh, in the case, if you, if you, if you paid something to to two party, then it is obvious that you paid to B and C. But if you use the newly generated address, so in the, in the second row, first picture, 
then it is not it is not obvious if you if you paid to to Bitcoin address B or C. Uh, and even further, if you if you use the the same privacy recommendation, and then from your change C, you pay to to to, to party D, and left over is E. From the perspective of somebody, he doesn't have any clue uh, who is who is the payer, who is the payee. So that is the most important recommendation. And uh, it is possible to go against her. And this, the, the same researchers from University of California managed to actually to add change address to the inputs, no matter it is so much, it is so much hard to recognize. So basically, uh, there is, there is multiple, multiple types of change handling methods that wallet software are implementing. And, uh, but, but basically, they are, they, are all, uh, they are all following same policy that change is always added to newly generated address. And user can, user can turn off that option, which is not good for him, because then it's easy to, to recognize the change address, obviously. So there is no any uh, exact algorithm how to recognize change address. But there were, there were some efforts. First effort was to use the fact that user rarely issued transactions to two different users. And this is completely obsolete now because, for example, on gambling sites, uh, where you have a game that wins multiple people, then they are making payouts to, to multiple persons. So you can't use that fact. Uh, the second. Uh, the second fact, change address amount is not greater than lowest input amount. Now, th this is, uh, to say, logical, because if change address amount is greater than lowest input amount, then it means that you could execute that payment without that uh, lowest input amount. But wallet softwares are aware of that, and they are obfuscating that in the way that they are always, uh, always uh, using the scheme of, of taking the set of input addresses in such a way that you can't use this, this approach. And the third one heuristic approach is change address is used only in one output over all past transactions. Uh, this is the actually the best approach and only one that can be used nowadays. So if, if the change address is used only, only once, is used only uh, if change, if change address is used only one output over all past transactions, that means that uh, actually the, you, are, you are tracing, you are tracing this, this third privacy recommendation. But the question is, is it safe? Because maybe somebody made payment to someone who still didn't do any transacting at all. So that is the, the only problem in this approach. So uh, now we're going to see results of change address heuristic that, that took uh, the, third, the third approach. So edge to input list, all addresses that is used only once in output over all past transactions. And this kind of experiment resulted in 4 million change addresses. And it was 13% of false positives. They managed to, to recognize false positives based on the fact that when you are looking into blockchain, when, when you are looking into blockchain in one point in the time, all transactions that are up in the, in, the, in the blocks are actually transactions that took place in the future. So you can see if that output address was actually used again. If yes, that means you have false positive. But uh, when, the, when they started to, to, 
to take a better look of those false positives, they, under, they managed to understand that 12% of those addresses were actually payback addresses. So uh, it was used by the service that is, that is paying back uh, the money on the, on the same address that you use to, to buy, to buy uh, whatever that service is offering. So it turns out that actually it is only 1% of false positives. And if they, they tried further with, with some improvements and uh, they actually tried to wait for one day so they can see if the address will be used again. And uh, in that way, they reduce false positives to 0.28%. In one week, if they wait for one week, they reduce to 0.17%. But even with 0.70%, they end up with mega cluster containing all these services. So what happened is that uh, there was a few of addresses that managed to link clusters together, and they were actually not change addresses. So you have complete disaster only because of few addresses. But then they, they actually took uh, another, uh, another view on, the, on those specific addresses and what happened with them. And uh, they realized that some addresses were used twice as uh, twice, two times as change, which is completely uh, not something what, what you will not see every day. And uh, so they excluded those cases, and they end up with 3.5 million of change addresses. There was no mega clusters again, and uh, they managed to tag uh, to tag. 2,197 clusters, which is 1.8 million addresses. And they started with 1,000 of target addresses. So with the approach of collecting addresses from, from forums, uh, of active pinging, of uh, ta collecting tags from blockchain info, you are able they, they collect 1,000 of tag addresses and they end up with uh, 1,800 times more. So it's really good result. Uh, how this can help me in my work? Uh, so basically, um, I hardly doubt that I will, with this method, directly de-anonymize the, the uh, the adversary, the, the attacker, the, the, the criminal. But what, what is possible is to, is to find transactions where, for example, cryptocurrency exchange made the direct payment to, to, that, to that criminal of, or the criminal did direct payment to, to exchange. Uh, if there is investigation open about this case in Croatia, then I can, with the effort of law enforcement agencies, I can basically uh, catch the attacker in, in, in that way. But with, without investigation, I've, I'm probably not able to do anything. OK, um, so that will be, that will be it for uh, transaction graph analysis. Now I'm going to tell you something more about real-time network analysis, which is, I think, more, uh, more interesting. Excuse me. So uh, real-time network analysis is basically a method to linking Bitcoin addresses to IP addresses. So this is something different than linking Bitcoin addresses to some tags find, find on the internet. Uh, this method is possible to distinguish different users even if they are behind uh, network address translators. So if you have multiple Bitcoin clients behind, behind NAT, uh, this method is able to, to label, to label different, different clients even if they're using the uh, same public IP address. 
uh, I will I will say later why is that possible. And uh, method is able to link different transactions to same user, even if they look completely unrelated in transaction graph analysis. So if I was unable to to link some addresses in the transaction graph analysis, uh, real-time network analysis can do it. So basically, real-time network analysis is can uh, enhance the the transaction graph analysis. Okay. So what is the problem? Problem is of course using a proxy because then you do not de de anonymize the uh, the actual IP address of user, but you de, -an de anonymize the IP address of proxy. And uh, actually, uh, there is a solution for that, and that is to simply shut down Bitcoin over Tor functionality. So I know that it sounds amazing, but actually it is possible to do. You can uh, shut down the whole B Tor network, and it is, it is quite simple to, to, to be used by any users. And I will, I will explain that in a moment. So actually, we, we need this. Uh, we need this. Uh, this shutdown, so we can observe the real-time network analysis on ClearNet. Like there is, there is no anonymization techniques used. Uh, Bitcoin is peer-to-peer -peer network, but actually we could use we we could. Uh, we could share the 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 peers in two different categories. Uh, one is the, the peers that are clients and other the peers that are servers. I put under the, the codes because it is not really client-server architecture, but rather uh, the thing is that clients are the peers that are able only to initiate outgoing connections. So those are home users and servers are peers that are able to receive incoming connections. And uh, each peer, whether, use, whether server or client, is trying to connect to eight entry nodes. So uh, Bitcoin have network discovery mechanism uh, that is used for each, for each client to, to be connected to eight entry nodes. Entry nodes are, of course, always servers because clients can't see each other. So basically, uh, Bitcoin does not use any uh, not traversal technique, but clients can reach each other across the, the servers. And uh, what is, what is uh, important to remark that is that uh, servers uh, can take at maximum 117 incoming connect connections from, from clients and uh, and everybody is initiating eight outgoing connections. So in total, there is 125 connections possible for each peer. In this case, only for servers. So uh, how is possible to, to distinguish the, the clients bef uh, behind that? It is possible because this approach of real-time network analysis is is actually uh, labeling uh, clients uh, in the way that it it associate it associates clients with its entry nodes. So every 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 client in this in this technique is presented as its entry nodes. Okay. And just uh, information that currently there is 8,000 servers and 100,000 of clients in the network. Okay. So how to disconnect Tor and in that way actually uh, have to say a clear situation of dealing with with uh, real-time analysis on ClearNet. Uh, disconnecting Tor is possible by exploiting Bitcoin's DOS protection, building DOS protection. 
So basically, when one peer is delivering malformed messages to some other peer, that other peer is banning him for 24 hours. So he is cutting connection for, with him and he is not allowing him to establish another connection. Uh, so now I'm talking from the perspective of attacker. Actually, I will be attacker when I will be doing this an the anonymization. Uh, attacker needs to, to establish connection. So first to say in this, uh, in this scenario, I'm observing that there is only two exit nodes in Tor network and only three Bitcoin servers. So attacker is establishing connection with each server and sending, uh, sending mal for message. And he's doing so uh, going through each of exit nodes. So in this way, you have the situation that all servers uh, banned all IP addresses of exit nodes. And now when, when, when we are looking the, the clients of the, the, the client part of, of Bitcoin network, and if they, are, if they try to connect to, to, to network using Tor, they, they will be unable to do it for the next 24 hours because all servers are banned through all possible exit nodes. And uh, I was watching recently at Tor Metrics, there is around 1,000 of Tor exit nodes and times 8,000 Bitcoin servers, you get that you need to upload one gigabyte of traffic of malformed messages actually to exclude all Tor network from usage for the Bitcoin, okay? Uh, so first, first part of, first part of real-time network de-anonymization is to learn entry nodes of clients. To do so, I need to explain something about ad address propagation uh, mechanism that is part of network discovery protocol in the, in the Bitcoin. So, uh, what is address propagation? It is basically the mechanism that, are, that is making the, the network alive. So, nodes are all the time coming and going and uh, coming to the network and go away from the network. And uh, basically, the peers need to learn all the time which, which are nodes available. So, if their entry nodes are leave, the, if their network nodes leave the network, uh, they are managing to find another entry nodes. Uh, ADDR message is a message that every peer sends to each of its connections uh, after, after, after the peer connects to, to the network. So every of his entry node is uh, aware of uh, of, of its address and those entry nodes are propagating further in the network uh, ADDR messages. So basically, in the matter of few seconds, you have plenty of nodes in the network that are aware of new, of new clients that, that approach to, to the network, that made connection to, to the entry nodes. Um, uh, there is there is one detail that is that is very very important, and that is uh, that address are propagated in the way that always is choose two responsible nodes. Each each node is choosing two responsible nodes that will receive the ADDR message and that will uh, forward the, the ADDR message further in the network. Uh, and basically when one node propagates some ADDR message with, with, with IP address included, uh, he will not 
propagate over that connection a DDR message ever again. So it, it happens only once. OK? OK, I promise I will not go deeper than this. This is technically the deepest thing of the presentation, but I need to say in order to, to explain the, the attack. Uh, so how to, how to choose responsible nodes? So when some peer receive a DDR message, he calculate hash for each, for each peer he's connected to, and hash is, uh, hash is the function of, of four variables, and that is the address x that is inside of a DDR message, some random salt, current day, and the address of peer structure of the, of the peer that is, that is candidate to be choose as responsible nodes. After that, all hashes are sorted, and first two hash are chosen to be the responsible, to the responsible nodes. The, the peers that are associated with two first hash when, when hash are sorted. Okay. Uh, so now, now I'm going to explain how to learn entry nodes of some client C how is attacker able to, to, to learn those entry nodes in this very simple configuration where you have only five servers and only a dozen of, of clients. So uh, what attacker needs to do is maintain a very big number of connection with each server in the network. Uh, this way, when the client connects to, uh, to the network, he chooses some entry nodes. For example, in this case, client chooses entry nodes 2, 3, and 4. Now, uh, when client starts to propagate its ADDR message with his IP address for other nodes to know for his existence, it is to expect it that node number 2 will choose will choose uh, the attacker as responsible node that because the fact that he have a lot of connection uh, of course so this way the attacker will receive ADDR message over over the entry nodes of client C and then the attacker notes that client with, with the address CA has entry nodes 3, 4, 5. 2, 3, 4, sorry. But uh, what is the problem with this approach? Yes, uh, chances are big for attacker to be chosen as the, uh, as the responsible node because very big amount of connection. But also there is a possibility that server choose some other node as responsible and he sends a DDR message to node 1 in this example and let's say attacker was lucky with other two and he received and he received a DDR message over nodes 3 and 4 so we now have the problematic situation where attacker learned that address of client with the, with the address CA has entry nodes 1, 3, and 4 when that is not a true, he have entry nodes 2, 3, and 4. So we have a false entry inside the, inside the associated list of, of that IP address we are trying to de-anonymize. Solution to, to this problem is based on the fact that same address is never resent over same connection. So the next strategy is proposed. It is proposed for attacker to broadcast a DDR, a DDR message of the address he want to de-anonymize, so that so that the responsible nodes, uh, which are which are not attackers, one are excluded. Uh, it's hard to understand it by, by words, so 
I'm going to show it in picture. So basically, attacker connects to all servers, and he sends a DDR message of client C. And uh, servers are choosing responsible nodes. In this case, servers are having only one or two connection, and therefore, they will, uh, they will choose as responsible connections all the connections on the, on the picture. Now, the attacker disconnect, and he connects again with a very big amount of connections to each server. And now, if server decides to, to have a responsible node, node one, he will not be able to, he will not be able to, uh, to send the IDDR message over that connection because he already did so and he's never doing it twice as I said before. So what's going to happen is that attacker is going to learn is going to learn entry nodes of the client but only the subset of entry nodes. So he learned that that client with address CA have a subset of entry nodes three and four. Now, some math. Uh, why is still the anonymization possible? If you have situation that we are unable to learn all entry nodes of, of some client, where basically peer can be uniquely identified if we know only three entry nodes. And that is because it is very unlikely that you have coll collision uh, of, of, of two different, different clients having, having the same three tuple subset of entry nodes. So it is very unlikely. So the conclusion is that you need only three entry nodes. You need to learn only three entry nodes in order to, to de-anonymize the, the client. Another thing is that if you, if you are able to maintain 35 connection to each server, in that case, uh, you, you, you stand a 50% chance to become the resp responsible node and that ADDR message is forward uh, toward, toward the attacker. So that means that on average of eight entry nodes, you will receive four ADDR messages. And as I said, the three entry nodes are enough. Uh, how often to broadcast address? Experiment done on University of Luxembourg uh, show that uh, 10 minutes seems to be a reasonable choice. So. The, the, the first part of strategy when you need to broadcast the IDDR message that you are trying to, that contain the address you are trying to de-anonymize, uh, it's, so resending of, of that address is needed to be done each 10 minutes. Uh, if you do it, if you do it more rarely than that, if you do it each 20 minutes, you, you are putting yourself in situation that 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 server can can change the responsible nodes, and then you can again have the false entry inside the inside the set. Okay. So what do we have at this point? At this point, we have example as example. We have uh, we learned we learned entry nodes of three different of three different clients, CA, CB, and CC. And now is the question, how to de-anonymize transaction? So how to know if some transaction is belonging to node CA, CB, or CC? Well, uh, this de-anonymization is possible uh, thanks, to, thanks to next propositions. Client and attacker are connected with one hop over entry node. So entry node is only one hop. And all other connections between them are two hops or more. So it is 
it is reasonable to conclude that attacker will see transactions coming from entry node before then from any other. Of course, this is the reasonable to conclude, but for example, uh, network latency on the, on, on the links of, between the entry node and the, and, the, and the client can be much bigger than over some other parts of network. And in that case, you may receive transaction before from some non-entry node than from entry node of, of, of the client you are trying to de-anonymize. De so that is the problem. Uh, but let's just see uh, what, what are the odds for, for such thing to happen. Uh, if, if we observe the situation when client is directly connected to attacker through entry node, then we have a situation that five messages needs to be exchanged, 16 checks needs to be done by, by the entry node before he sends transaction further because uh, every node is first checking the, well, is making the validation of the transaction before checking it further. And we have some random time that needs to, to pass before the transaction is sent. And if we have two hops, then we have eight messages, 32 checks, and two random trickling delays. So basically, it is, uh, it is to expect that we will receive the, the transaction before from, from the client's entry node, then from some other node. OK. And some final things for the anonymization. How is it possible to be? So uh, I'm going to demonstrate example where we successfully uh, de-anonymize transaction transaction one, and just to remember, the entry node sets of client C, A, C, B, and C, C were as follows. Okay, so we take first 15 transactions because we are expecting that between first 15 transactions should be the entry nodes of the, of the client that sent that transaction. And when we, are, when we do intersection, with, uh, with entry nodes that we de-anonymized, we get situation that inter intersection have uh, so big cardinalities, so big sets, that it is ambiguous if CA or CB or CC generated transactions. So basically, you can't know who generated because you took uh, too much big, too big set, too big set of of entry nodes, and on the other side, you can take very few of, of, of the nodes that first sent the transaction, and then you have situation that intersection is very small. In this case, cardinality of each set is two, so there is no enough uh, th there is no enough cardinality to distinguish client, and I remember you that I said it is needed two. It is needed uh, three entry nodes. It is needed three entry nodes to to distinguish some client. Uh, the same research from University of Luxembourg showed that best balance is actually first ten first ten nodes. So if we take first 10 nodes from uh, first 10 nodes from the ordered list from the ordered list of the of the transactions we, we received, we have situation that only address CA have cardinality of three, so node CA, CA generated the transaction. In this way, we actually we actually managed to associate IP address with. Uh, with the transaction. Okay, uh, so basically, what what the guys from the Luxembourg did, they set up a testnet with 250 Bitcoin servers. Uh, they wrote custom attacker client uh, using the module that is available online. 
written in uh, Google language. And uh, they use the standard uh, Bitcoin core clients. And from such experiment, they, from, from any experiment they run, they came up with the numbers that I just talked about. So propagation of ADDR message each 10 minutes is enough. Uh, count for only first 10 nodes to forward transaction. And three entry nodes for identification is seen from the pure math. It is not important to run experiments. As a result, they managed to de-anonymize 60% of all transactions. Okay, and uh, using statistics for, from such experiment, uh, using statistics for, su for such experiment, they actually calculated that successful de-anonymization in a real Bitcoin network would be 11%. In other words, you should, uh, you should wait for, for a client to send, on average, nine transactions to be able to de-anonymize him. How this can help me in my work? So, direct de-anonymization, which is highly unlikely because uh, that user is probably using uh, Tor. And uh, of course, I can exclude Tor, but then is the question if he's going to transact at all. Uh, indirect de-anonymization. So basically, if somebody paid, if I manage to de-anonymize somebody uh, who paid money to, 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 the, to the person that I'm looking for, or vice versa. And, uh, Again, I need, to, I need to have the assistance of law enforcement agencies for, uh, to, to, to come to information about, about those persons just based on the IP address and timestamp. Otherwise, I can do anything. And uh, also, in combination with transaction graph analysis, uh, uh, real-time analysis can be very useful. Okay, and just some final words. Um, so, network real-time analysis requires IP address beforehand. So, basically, I can't de-anonymize anything if I don't have the IP address already available. So, only thing, only thing basically what I have is a uh, Bitcoin address of, of, the, of the criminal. Um, even if I know in, in, in which network he is situated, I would need to advertise all IP range of that network just to be able to de-anonymize him. Uh, estimated success rate of 11% for de-anonymization is very poor and um, it, I mean it's very hard to expect somebody to send nine, nine transactions during one session. And the third, third thing is that I'm not really uh, comfortable with comfortable with um, with doing so much connections on servers. Uh, doing 35 connections to each server in Bitcoin networks means degrading degre its quality of service. And um, I'm not really the person who, who would do such thing. And uh, as I said, uh, success rate is very poor, however. But uh, I needed to do this, this research in order just to, to know what, what are my, where am I standing with this and what are my chances to do it. And I thought it is a um, very interesting team to, to talk about. But uh, I think that I, I will stay on uh, transaction graph analysis for, for, for the purpose of de-anonymization and for sure, I will, not, I will not use this network approach. So basically, that is all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Franco Marik. Thank you.